We are obviously in Ephesians chapter 6 tonight. That's where we're starting. And uh, we will be studying about the uh, breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, two pieces of the armor of God, and then we have, that leaves us one piece uh, for tomorrow night. Um, for those of you who have been here, I hope this has been a helpful study for us and uh, something that's helped to rejuvenate our faith and to build us up in those things that we need to be doing as Christians. Uh, obviously, as we have done for the last two nights, if you have not been here, uh, you won't know this. If you have been, you're going to think, well, we've already done this. Well, we're soldiers, right? Uh, we're soldiers in the Lord's army, and we've gathered together, so we've got to start with our troop briefing like we've done for the last two nights because we've got to put this in context. Uh, here we are teaching children about weapons. Hello. Here we are teaching children about armor, uh, that they are supposed to put on. Uh, why are we doing that? Why are we teaching these lessons? What's the, what, what is the context, not just the Ephesians 6 context, but the, but the Bible context of why are we talking about the armor of God this week? Uh, and so we're going to look at our troop briefing. What is the A in our armor or our troop briefing? Alert. Alert, Alert brethren, we're at war. We need to be reminded of that. Uh, I know some of us are reminded of that on a daily basis. Uh, and we recognize uh, that we are at war. Some others may not. We may forget about it. We may lull into some kind of a spiritual uh, siesta every once in a while and not, not remember, we are at war. And when we read our New Testaments and the warnings that God gives to us in the New Testament, we recognize, yeah, we're at war. We need to be ready for how to deal uh, with this war. What's the first R in armor? The reality, the reality of this war is that we are in a death struggle for souls. We are in a death struggle to save the souls of individuals who have never been saved. One day they're going to die. One day they're going to meet their, meet their maker on the day of judgment. And where they go in eternity could have a lot to do with us and what we do. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night. But we're in a death struggle for souls. But not just the souls of the lost. We're in a death struggle for the souls of the saved, aren't we? Once, once you're saved, are you guaranteed that you're always saved? That's not what the New Testament teaches. And so do we need to recognize that we all need each other and that we're looking out for each other's souls? We're in a death struggle for our children's souls. And if you're not struggling for them, somebody else is. The devil's going to do all that he can to get his tentacles wrapped around your children. How much are we fighting for them? And we're in a death struggle for our souls. You're in a death struggle for your soul. The most valuable thing on this earth. So what's the M in our troop briefing on armor? Mandate. The mandate is? Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of not my might or your might, in the power of His might, put on the whole armor of God. One of these days we're going to figure out why our projector uh, likes to flash on and off. Maybe it's just to see if you're paying attention. Uh, but the mandate is we've got to be ready for this war. How do we get ready? We allow God to, to strengthen us. That's where our true strength comes from. We find our strength in God. And then we take every piece of that armor and we put every piece of, of the armor that he tells us to put on. We put it on, and once we put it on, we've got to keep it on. Did, did your kids ever get tired of wearing something that you had put on them and they just start taking those clothes off and they're not interested in wearing those clothes? Um, when we put something on, we've got to keep it on. Uh, did, your, did your kids ever have trouble keeping their shoes on? Uh, we're going to talk about shoes tomorrow night, uh, but... Uh, once you put your armor on, you've got to keep it on. And that's the God says, put it on and keep it on. What's the O in our armor? We've got an opponent. We've got an enemy. And we need to be ever mindful of, that, of the fact that he is out there seeking to devour us. Uh, and so we've got to be sober. We've got to be vigilant, watchful, be mindful, and, and ever, uh, ever aware of what he's trying to do to take us down. Uh, he's, not, he's not going to take a rest. And, uh, and so we need to be, we need to be ever 
uh, watchful for what he's doing. And then what's the last R in armor? Responsibility. responsibility. We have a responsibility given to us by God that once we have allowed him to strengthen us, receive our, his strength uh, to, uh, to become ready for this battle, and we put on the entire armor of God, then we are then prepared to take a stand. Three times in those verses in Ephesians 6, we see that word stand. And one time we see the word withstand. And so it's not that we put the armor on and then we go lay down on the couch. Uh, it is that we put the armor on and we take a stand for truth. We take a stand for righteousness. We take a stand for, for those things that are, that are essential for Christianity. And then last night we added one more element uh, to make some of our... Uh, uh, fellow brethren happy. We added that letter U in there uh, and to, to, rec to represent that who's responsible for all of this? You are. You can't forget you. Uh, there's what, Mary? It could be us. Yeah, but us, is, us just, it just doesn't have the ring of you. Um, uh, and and if you know, sometimes if we say we have the responsibility, or sometimes if you put multiple people in charge of a project, you know what happens sometimes? It doesn't get done. Or one person ends up doing it. How does, how is that, how does that happen that way? Uh, what, what, what do we need to realize? Has God given us a group project? Yes. Did you ever get involved in a group project in school or at work where you were hoping a certain person was in your group? Because you know that person was brilliant. You knew that person was a hard worker. You knew that person would take on most of the work and you'd get some of the credit for it. So you were okay with that. You ever want, did you ever get in a group project and you were hoping you didn't get a certain person? Because you knew that person wasn't going to do diddly squat in the group. That you knew that person wasn't going to help and they were going to kind of bring it. You ever don't don't be looking or pointing or, you know, anything like that. But you you know, those kind of people. Has God given us a group project? Yeah. yeah. Are there some brethren who are stronger in some areas, some brethren who are weaker in some areas? Yes. How much am I responsible in this group project? Can I say, well, T Taylor's Taylor's doing pretty good. <clears throat> Taylor's pretty strong. I'm just, I'm just going to ride along in Taylor's wake and, uh, and, and coast along. How's that going to work for me? It's not going to work. Yeah, it's a group project that we have, but each of us, hear this, each of us are equally responsible for what God has given to us. In Matthew chapter 25, in the parable of the talents, there was a five-talent man, a two-talent man, and a one-talent man. Why did the master give five to one, two to one, and one to the last guy? He gave to each one according to their ability. Why didn't he give the one talent man five talents? Knew he couldn't handle it. Why didn't he give the five talent man one talent? He, he, he could handle a whole lot more. But God gave to each one according to their ability. When the master came back and called those servants to account, was he easier on some than he was on others? Was, the, what, was, was his standard of judgment, was it imbalanced in any way? Where, where some he had a, 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 maybe a, a, an easier go on them because, well, you know, they're just not all that strong. No. No. He had a level expectation for each and every one of them. What he had given to them, he expected back from them in their service. So whatever God has given to us, we have an equal responsibility to carry out that responsibility he's given to us. So that's, that's the troop briefing that we start with every night to remind us and to put all of this into context. So tonight we have the task of covering uh, two pieces of this armor, to talk about the breastplate of righteousness and to talk about uh, the helmet of salvation. When you think about and it, what we do with each of these, if you haven't been here, we talk about the physical part of that armor, and then we look at how God makes a spiritual application with the spiritual armor, and then uh, we talk about what's my responsibility when it comes to that. When you think about the physical 
breastplate of a, of a Roman soldier. Uh, there in Ephesians chapter 6, where it says to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The word breastplate there comes from the Greek word thorax. Do you know any words that come from thorax? How about thorax? Do we know what our thorax is? Uh, have, have you watched enough CSI and NCIS and all of those things to hear about uh, you know, injuries and surgeries to the thorax? Uh, it's, it's interesting. Here's a Greek word. Breastplate is what it means. And what, what is it talking about? It's talking about, it's talking about a piece of armor that would cover the chest, that would start at the neck and would go down and connect to that belt that we talked about the first night. And here was this breastplate that was to protect, well, to protect some of the most vital organs, to protect your heart. And we have mentioned along the way in the last couple of nights that there are a lot of folks that, that say, that here is all of this armor, but the back, there's nothing for the back. Well, sometimes the Roman breastplate covered the back as well. It was not always just something that covered the front, but some, oftentimes it was a piece that would cover both the front and the back uh, so, that, so that you've got protection all around. Think about that. So that you have protection all around. Uh, sometimes that would be, uh, uh, sometimes it was made out of leather. Uh, oftentimes it was made out of some sort of a chain mail, or, and sometimes it was actually a, a solid piece of metal uh, that they had fashioned to fit around them and, and for them to wear. Think about wearing that. How heavy do you think those were? We talked last night about that shield, that huge shield that they would carry. And, 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 and we've talked about that sword. You think that was some, one of these little plastic swords out here, that, one of these paper swords? How heavy, how heavy do you think that was? You know, you, you, think about, you think about all of this armor that they were supposed to put on, and here, here is this 20-plus pound breastplate that they would put on and wear going out to battle. These guys have got to be fit. Eva? Yeah, yeah. You remember, you remember in uh, in First Samuel chapter seventeen the story of Ga of David and Goliath, and Saul wanted to protect David. So here, take my armor and put it on. Well, what do you remember about Saul's stature? What does the Bible tell us? He's head and shoulders above everybody else, and and in 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 our minds, not necessarily in reality here, but in our minds, this is little boy David, because that's the song, right? I mean, the song can't be wrong. So it's, it's little boy David, and in the pictures you've seen in your coloring books, he's like seven years old, right? Uh, so here's, but he's older than that, but here's, here's David. Is he going to wear Saul's armor? Well, it doesn't even fit, and it's too heavy. And, and Eva's right, he, he does not go out to battle in that. But here's, picture a Roman soldier decked out in all of his armor, and there's that breastplate. And what does God say this breastplate is for us? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now hold your finger in Ephesians 6. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because you also read about the breastplate over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is just to, uh, to get you to study this part of it and compare it with the other. We're not going to spend time... Uh, delving into this, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, putting on the breastplate of what? Faith. Of faith and love. Well, which one is it? Did God get confused? Is it a breastplate of righteousness, or is it a breastplate of faith and love? Well, wouldn't it be all of the above? Um, 
Does righteousness require any kind of faith and love to be a part of it? Does faith and love have anything to do with righteousness and the way that we live? I'm sure it does. They're all tied together. Uh, and so sometimes you, you may spend some time comparing those two thoughts together and recognizing that what is it that is designed to protect us? What is it that's used that God designs to protect us when we go out to battle? And it's faith. It's love, but over here in Ephesians chapter 6, it's the breastplate of righteousness that God has designed to protect our hearts. Do we need our hearts protected? And, and obviously here we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about our, um, the organ, the blood pumping organ. But do we need our hearts protected? Uh, do, do we need to have our... our uh, our emotional, the emotional side of us protected? Do we need to have the side of us protected by which the Bible talks about we even make our decisions? When the Bible says we're to love the Lord with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength, is your heart involved in that? Sure it is. Is our heart involved in our obedience to Christ? Sure it is. And so we need, we need our heart protected. What is it that protects our heart? Interesting, it's righteousness. Uh, how, how, does, how does righteousness uh, protect our heart? Well, I want to put up a couple things here, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll skip through some of these, but what, what is righteousness all about? When you think about righteousness, what is that? Being right, isn't it? That's, that's the base of it. What would you say, Dirk? Doing what's right. Does righteousness have anything to do with being right in our relationship with God? Can you be righteous and not be right with God? No. How, how, does, somebody be, how does somebody become right with God? You've got to obey His commands. Back up before that. How does somebody become right with God? Okay, you got to hear and believe. Back up before that. How does somebody become right with God? You got to be born, you got to study. Okay, back up before that. How does one become right with God? Everybody got silent. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, God made him who knew no sin. Was that before you heard? believed and repented and confessed and were baptized and obeyed the gospel. God made him who knew no sin to be sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. God wanted us to become righteous in His eyes. So before we ever came into this world, He had a plan. He sent His Son he sent His Son into this world, and He took on our sins in order that we might be made into a right relationship with God. We, we need, the, the first thing we need to think about when we think about righteousness, we think about it's right living, it's right doing, it's doing what's right. All of that is right. <laughs> All of that is right. But the first thing we've got to realize is none of that makes any difference. Me living right, doing right, none of that makes any difference without Christ. You could be the most wonderful person on the earth. You could do wonderful things, live uh, ab above reproach and everything, but if it's not for Christ, none of that matters. So it, for the first part of understanding righteousness, we've got to understand there was a righteousness that God had in mind long before we ever came into existence and it involved Jesus dying on the cross, sacrificing Himself for us. And then... What does God expect of us to become righteous? Does He expect us to live right? Yeah, and that's, that's, what, righteousness, that's what righteousness is. Uh, and, and so here's, here's maybe three or four points about living right. Who gets to decide what is right? We live in a confusing world right now. We live in a confusing world. Who gets to decide what's right and what's wrong? Supreme Court? Your senators? Your congressmen? The president, 
He gets to decide what's right and what's wrong. And if you say it's the president, then I'd have to ask you the question, the president of which country? Who gets to decide what's right and what's wrong? And if the president of this country decides something that is, is right, what if the president of another country says, no, that's wrong? Hmm. Which president are we supposed to listen to? Which, well, it is called confusion. So who gets to decide what's right and what's wrong? Well, obviously that's God. Uh, there's a couple passages in, in Romans chapter 10. This is a good passage for you to know over in Romans chapter 10 because uh, Scott mentions confusion. Here were some people who were confused over in Romans chapter 10. Paul said in verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He wanted more than anything for his brethren to be saved. In fact, if you back up a chapter into chapter 9, uh, he, he was willing even that he would become accursed if it were possible uh, for, uh, uh, for them to be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But what? It's not according to knowledge. They have a zeal for God, but it's not based upon knowledge. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. Does that sound familiar? Do anything happening? Do we live in a world today that is ignorant of God's righteousness? Yes. Well, does that mean they're not interested in righteousness? No, they've just created their own. So they have established their own righteousness and have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Who gets to decide what's right? Who gets to decide what's wrong? Well, that's God. And so when we talk about living right and doing right, it's not based upon my standard. It's not based upon what I feel is right or what I feel is wrong. It's not based upon what my grandparents led me to believe. It's, there's a standard. And, and in Psalm 119 and verse 172, it says, The commandments of God are righteousness. So he gets to decide. So when we think about the breastplate of righteousness, here's something interesting for you to think about, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow night. When you think about each of these six pieces of armor. Guess what all six of them have in common? Guess what all six of them have in common so much that it could be that every one of these pieces is the same thing. They all have in common the Word of God. What's your greatest defense mechanism as a Christian? It's the Word of God. What is it that God has to protect your head? Does it have anything to do with the Word of God? What is it that God has to protect your chest, your, thora, your, your thorax? Righteousness. Righteousness based upon what? The Word of God. What is it that we have in our right hand? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is it that we have in our left hand? It's the shield of faith. And faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And, and our shoes that we'll talk about tomorrow night are the preparation of the gospel of peace. What do all of the pieces of the armor of God have in common? What's our greatest weapon? What's our greatest offensive and defensive weapon? What is it that protects us from Satan better than anything else? The Word of God. At every turn. For every part. And so here's, here's the right... Here God says, what, what is it that's going to protect your heart? Well, it's, it's going to be righteousness, and it's going to be righteousness based upon His standards and, and not our standards. And so we need to conform ourselves to that standard. Is that hard? Is it hard sometimes to conform ourselves to some standard other than our own? You know, when, when, we, when we were born into this world, the only person we cared about was number one. The only person's eyes we could see through and see things uh, from any perspective was our own. We were born, we grew up, and all we ever thought about was me, 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 me. At some point along the way, guess what had to happen? I had to learn to see things through somebody else's eyes. I had to learn to see life through somebody else's eyes. I had to learn to not be so much concerned about what I want, but about what somebody else wants. What is it? What am I talking about? That's crazy talk. 
How does somebody become a Christian? They've got to see things through God's eyes. They've got to see a standard other than their own God's standard. And so I've got to learn to conform myself, and that's how I become righteous in the eyes of God, is I conform my will to His will. Y'all, have, I've done all this. Anybody have any comments? Looks like you're, you're chewing on some of this. That uh, you're, Scott? 10, 6. 10, 6, Romans 10, 6. For the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? But that righteousness is of heaven. That's what it's oh, yeah. Well, the, 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 whole, the whole book of Romans is, is, is about righteousness. And the whole book of Romans is, is about righteousness and how do I become righteous in the eyes of God? Truly become righteous in the eyes of God. Go home and do a concordant search on righteous or righteousness in the book of Romans and it, and, and it, is, it is peppered throughout the book because that's what the book is. The book of Romans is about how do I become justified in the eyes of God? How can I be made righteous? How can I be made right? That's what the word justified means. How can I be made right, righteous, in the eyes of God? And that's, that's the beauty of the book of Romans, is that Paul presents this from the case of those Jews who thought, oh, I become righteous through the law. And he takes that argument apart and says, I only become righteous through the righteousness of God that he's given to me. So putting on the breastplate of righteousness involves, involves living right. Uh, righteousness involves walking right. Uh, it's not just about how God sees me. I've got to walk uprightly in the eyes of man, too. Does it matter how man sees me? Yeah. When Jesus says, we sang the song about, uh, about our light, let our light so shine. Well, why do we let our light so shine? That men may see our good works, and do what? Glorify God. So what, what's my responsibility? Is my responsibility in righteousness only to consider how God sees me? Well, yes, but I need to be mindful of how do others see me. Look, look in the book of 1 Peter. Look in 1 Peter. Let's start in chapter 4 for a second. When you turn to the book of 1 Peter, uh, what, one thing you need to think about is that both of the books, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, were about suffering. Uh, both of the books of 1 Peter and 2 Peter were about suffering and persecution that Christians were experiencing. The difference between the two books is that the book of 1 Peter is about suffering and persecution that Christians were experiencing from outside, external forces, outside of their Christian faith. Uh, so the world and, uh, and, and people outside of Christianity were persecuting them and causing them to suffer. When you get to 2 Peter, you still have suffering, you still have persecution, but it's coming from inside the body of Christ. And uh, there are problems that they're experiencing in the body of Christ. So those are the, that's the difference. So when you turn to the book of 1 Peter, think about the fact that this, the context of this book is the suffering and persecution that Christians were having uh, from those outside. Look, uh, uh, I wanted to start in verse 4, but drop to verse 12 for a second. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. What's this book about? It's about suffering. It's about trials. It's about persecutions that were going to come upon them. And so he says, don't think it strange that you're going to suffer persecution. Back up to verse 4. This thinking it strange is back up in verse... Well, look in, uh, look in verse 3. No longer live the rest of that he should no longer live. Talking about uh, the one who's given his life to Christ should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but he should live for the will of God. Isn't that what we're talking about? Righteousness is I conform myself to the will of God. Well, why do we do that? Verse three, because we have spent enough of our past lifetime. Some of you can say Amen and Amen to this. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of man. How much time have we wasted in our lives doing the will of the world? We've wasted it. 
And that's what Peter says. We've spent enough of our time doing that. When we did what? When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, uh, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. We've spent enough of our time in all of that junk. But you know what happens? When we come out of that world, do we still have people who know us in that world? Yeah, and what does verse 4 say? In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. And so what do they do? They speak evil of you. What's happening? You become a Christian. You're called out of darkness into the light of God. That's back in chapter 2. You're called out of the darkness into the light of God, but there are still people in darkness who know you, and they look at you. They see you. They observe you. And what do they think? What's this guy doing? This isn't him. This isn't the one I've known all of these years. No, that, and what do they, they think it's strange. What is he doing? He's not running with us in this, in this junk anymore. He's, he, oh, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, he, he's not going to do all of this stuff with us anymore. Okay, Mr. Holier Than Thou, all right, we see who you are now. They're looking at us. They see us. Back, back to chapter 3. Back, we're, we're just going to back up into chapter 2, but back up into chapter 3 first. Look at verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, here's a Christian woman married to a non-Christian man, even if they do not obey the word, they without a word might be won by the conduct of their wives. How could he be won by the conduct of his wife? What, look at verse 2. When the non-Christian husband observes the chaste conduct of his wife. What's happening? They're looking at us. They're observing us. question is, what do they see? What do, they, what, do, what do people see when they look at us? Back up into chapter 2. Look in chapter 2 and verse 11. We could look in verse 9 where it says, We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, the same group of people that think it's strange you're not running with them anymore in chapter 4, having your conduct honorable among those Gentiles in the world that when they speak against you as evildoers, because that's what they're going to do, right? Chapter 4, verse 4, they look at you, what's wrong with him? He's not running with us anymore. They speak evil of you. So what they would speak evil of you as e when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. What's happening? There are people looking at us. What do they need to see? They need to see righteousness. They need to see us conformed to the righteousness of God. So it's not just how God sees us, but it is, am I living uprightly in the eyes of man? Turn, turn one other passage to Titus chapter 2. Because in Titus chapter 2, it's, it's similar to 1 Peter chapter 2, but it gives us a little, a little bit of uh, another piece of, uh, uh, of information here. Titus chapter 2, start in verse 7. Titus 2 and verse 7. In all things... Showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Why? Because people are looking at you. And when they look at you, they need to observe that you are a pattern, you are a model, you are an example to them of good works. So in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and sound speech. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent. Put this, think about those people we read about in 1 Peter. Those people who speak evil of you at one time. Somebody who is an opponent, when they look at your conduct, when they look at your pattern of good works, they may be ashamed because now they have nothing evil to say of you. You take away their, you take away their ammunition, at least their real ammunition, when you live a righteous life before them. That they may have nothing evil to say of you. What is righteousness? It's a breastplate. And when I devote myself to a lifestyle of righteousness, 
Not only do I protect myself against the attacks, I can even prevent the attacks to begin with by the way that I live my faith out in the eyes of other people. I know that doesn't always work because there's people like 1 Peter chapter 4 that are just going to speak evil of you all of the time, no matter what. But what happens when I do live it? Think about, think about how this protects us. Does righteousness actually protect us? Yeah. Right living in the eyes of God and living uprightly in the eyes of man will protect us against the attacks of Satan. So, what have we got to do? Well, we've got 20 minutes, so we've got to move on. But what are we, what's our responsibility? We've got to put this on. We've got, to get this, we've got to get this breastplate of righteousness and put it on. And we're not going to look at these verses, but just consider some of these verses that talk about righteousness and what my responsibility is. That verse in 1 Corinthians 15 is interesting. Awake to righteousness. It's time for some of us to wake up. To wake up to righteousness and say, that's what I want to be. And then I need to be someone who seeks first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Not mine, seeking His first. I need to be somebody who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Doing what's right. Living right in the eyes of God. Look, I, look in first, in, uh, not first, uh, go to Acts chapter 10. I do want to look at one of these. Because in Acts chapter 10, when you turn to that chapter, think about Peter and the trouble that Peter was having in taking the gospel to the Gentiles and recognizing that they were equal, they were to be equal recipients of the gospel as he was, as the Jews were. And after his experience at the household of Cornelius, a Gentile, in Acts 10 and verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, what does he mean by that expression, in every nation? Who is this going to apply to? Jews? Gentiles? Everybody. People, everybody that could possibly live on the earth. And so he, he, is, he is having his eyes opened to every nation, including Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, it doesn't matter. But in every nation, whoever fears Him and... What's the word you have after that? Works. Anybody got a different word than the word works? Does. Anybody have the word practices? I don't know if anybody's got the word practices here. It's the same thing. Whoever fears God... What, what's the whole duty of man in Ecclesiastes 12? Fear God and... Keep His commandments. Well, here's the, here's the New Testament version of that. Whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by God. Does righteousness take effort on my part? Sure it does. So there is the righteousness of God that He, that he sent His Son to die in order that I might become righteous in His eyes. But God expects me to be obedient and to take my faith and to mix it with works and to work what is right in His eyes. And when I do that, He says, that's a piece of armor that I can't forget, that I can't lose. And it will protect my heart. Uh, it will protect what is very vital to me as a Christian. Anybody got any comments about the breastplate of righteousness before we go on to the helmet of salvation? Nothing? No, you got to put it on. And when you put it on, you got to lock it on. you got to keep it on. Can righteousness sometimes be uncomfortable? You ever have one of those shirts that's got a tag in it? Right back here? That you think, this is like from the devil. You had one of those shirts, right? When they invented tagless shirts, that person should have been given a Nobel Peace Prize for inventing a tagless shirt, all right? Because he created peace in a, lot of, in a lot of places, right? But that's an irritating thing, you know, that, 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 that's just there and continues. Can righteousness be uncomfortable sometimes? When you're the only one, seemingly, when you're the only one you feel like trying to live right and do right, can you get uncomfortable sometimes in that kind of a situation? 
Are, uh, look, look at Elijah, who thought he was the only one left. What do you do in that situation? Seriously, what do you do when you think you're the only one? Okay, strengthen your faith. What do you do? I'm the only one. Okay, yeah, I heard this lesson about righteousness, but I'm like the only one who cares about this. You keep doing it. Is that what you said? You don't give up. You keep on going. What else? You pray about it. When you think you're the only one, are you? No. Why did God, when He saved you, put you in the church? So that you would remember you're not the only one. Does everybody in the church have it all together? Are, are, does everybody else in the church, have they got this righteousness thing down to a perfection? Mm, y'all, some of you are looking around like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> um, why? There are none of us that got it down perfect yet. But we're all trying. And guess what happens when we try together? Will we encourage each other? And remember, I'm not the only one trying to do this. All right, let's think about the helmet of salvation. Think about the physical helmet. Um, I know some of you played football in the days when it was just that leather helmet on top. And, and, and in some cases, uh, in some cases uh, there, there was a time in the Roman army that some of their soldiers, that's all they wore. Uh, what was it was a leather helmet. Uh, you weren't very high up in the ranks uh, if all you got was a leather helmet. Uh, but th- this, this would be talking about likely that bronze helmet uh, that they would wear. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that thing would be? I mean, think about, think about putting that on your head, not, not just the weight of it. And, and they say they would put some kind of a cloth or, or something inside to make it you know, make it a little more comfortable. But you go out to battle. You strap that dude on your head. How long is it going to be until you get tired of it? That'd be like the old steel pot. Yeah. The old steel pot. Okay. It'd be like the old steel pot. Um, would you get tired of that thing being there? That's tough, Dirk. Right up until the first time you get hit in the head. <laughs> <laughs> right up until the first time you get hit in the head, you think, oh, good thing I got this thing on my head. Uh, here's the helmet that they put on that that they would strap on designed obviously to protect their head designed to protect their brain designed to protect their mind because a soldier needs to be able to think straight when he's out on the battlefield he's got to be able to make good decisions and if you get whacked in the head pretty hard you're going to some people have a hard time making good decisions without a good whack in the head (laughs) but if you get a good whack because you don't have that helmet on so here's now what what does God liken this to what has got the spiritual part of this armor is it's the helmet of salvation. How does that apply? How does that work? You know, we, we, might, be, we might be able to, to grasp, okay, sort of the spirit. It's the word of God. It's, it, it's sharp. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it's used in an offensive, defensive way. Okay, I got that one. And, and, a, and a shield of faith. Yeah, I, I can understand that. larger my faith is, the more I'm protected. Helmet of salvation. Okay, what's that got to do with anything? What is, what, how does a helmet apply to salvation? The first sin that was ever committed on this earth was Satan coming to Eve and saying, You shall not surely die. What was he doing? trying to get in her head. He's trying to get in her head, get in her mind. And the Bible says he did. He deceived her. He got in her head and made her think something different than what God had said. He deceived her. When she was deceived, was there something she forgot? Was was there something that she forgot? Did she forget about her relationship with God? The devil got in her head and got her all mixed up because if she ate of that fruit, he said it would make her like what? Make you like God. You don't even need God. You eat of this fruit and you'll be like God. What did she forget? God. Forgot what God had done for her. 
forgot about her relationship with God. When we put on the helmet of salvation, what do we need to remember? What is it that can protect us? Remembering that we are saved. How often do you think about your salvation? How often do you think about what Jesus did on the cross? I wonder, when the devil came to tempt us, if in our minds we pictured Jesus hanging on the cross and His blood dripping down from His body, I wonder if we could envision that when the devil tempts us, how many times would we give in to that temptation? What is the cross? It is a picture of our salvation. He died to save us. How can I be protected from the onslaught of the devil to be mindful of my salvation? Now, salvation has, for the Christian, salvation has uh, different tenses. It's got a past tense, it's got a present tense, and it has a future tense. So if I'm going to have confidence in my battle against the devil, I need to remember that in the past that I have been saved. For a Christian, when did that happen? When, when, when for a Christian, they were saved when they were baptized for the remission of their sins. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So when I am a Christian and the devil is coming at me and trying to tempt me to do all sorts of wrong, one thing that ought to give me confidence, one thing that ought to protect me is to be mindful of the fact, wait a minute, I was saved back then. Now, why did I do that? Why, why did I get baptized? What was that all about? I got baptized because I learned what Jesus did for me. And I learned that He died for my sins, that He was buried, and that He was raised from the dead. And I learned that's what I needed to do. That I needed to die to sin and be buried in water and raised to walk in newness of life. And that's what I did. And when I'm tempted to sin, I need to, I need to remember, wait a minute. Why would I do that when I did that? Why would I give in to this sin? Why would, why would I allow the devil to, to, to get to me on this when, when I remember that day I was baptized? Those of you who are Christians, do you remember the day when you came up out of the water? Do you remember perhaps the one who baptized you, or maybe it was just a thought that you had, I don't have a, the person baptizing you saying it, or a thought that you had, I don't have a single solitary sin. I don't even have a sliver of a sin. I, I, I don't have a stain of a sin. I don't have a fingernail clipping of a sin. I don't have anything of a sin left to my account. It is gone. When I'm tempted to sin, what if I remembered that? What if I remembered my salvation? Is that a piece of armor against the devil? But it's not just my salvation in the past. It's my salvation right now. What was it that washed away my sins when I was baptized? Blood of Jesus. Wasn't the water. Nothing fancy about that chlorine. It was the blood of Jesus that washed away your sin. When I'm a Christian, am I going to sin even after I become a Christian? Absolutely. Going to sin after I become a Christian. Uh, and if I say I don't have any sins, I'm a liar. The truth is not in me. But I am going to sin. God doesn't want me to sin. I don't want to sin. But I am going to sin. And when I sin, is there any way for me to get rid of that sin? He who walks in the light as he is in the light has fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us. How powerful is that blood that keeps on cleansing us? Is it just as powerful as the blood that washed away our sins in baptism? Or is it like a weaker version of it? Is it... Is it watered down a little bit to, to, to remind the Christian, hey, I'm going to leave a little bit there just to remind... Did you ever do that to your kids? 
Maybe just leave a little reminder for them to, you know, we're, we're just going to leave this here to remind you of how poorly of a choice that you're making right now. Does God do that for us? Say, I'm going I'm to wash away most of this, but we're just going to leave a little bit right here so that you can remember, David, not to do that again. Is that how God operates? We walk in the light, verse 7. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to wipe them all out. When I'm tempted to sin, what do I need to remember? I've got a God in heaven who right now is washing me, washing me, washing me, washing me, washing me, washing me, washing me from my sins. Why would I want to give Him more work to do? Why would I want to cause more shame for what I'm doing? Now, not that I, just I ha that I was saved in the past, not that, that I continue to be saved, but that what? I am going to. To be saved. Look, look, we, we turned to 1 Thessalonians 5 a minute ago. Go back there. Go to 1 Thessalonians ch chapter 5 again because he mentions the breastplate in verse 8, but he also mentions the helmet in verse 8. And he, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he mentions the helmet a little bit differently than the way he mentions it in Ephesians. In Ephesians, it is uh, take the helmet of salvation. How does he word it in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8? What is the helmet? The hope of salvation. Is the hope of salvation that I was saved in the past? No, not really. Is the hope of salvation that God is saving me right now from my sins? No, not really. What's the hope of salvation? Hope has an expectation. What's the hope? Hope is that He is going to save me eternally. In, 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 Hebrew, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, it says that Jesus is the author of eternal something to all who obey Him. Eternal salvation. Am I saved right now? If I am a Christian... If I am a faithful Christian right now, am I saved? Am I 100% saved right now? If, am I, if I am living a faithful life, if I have put on righteousness, and I am living and doing right in the eyes of God, am I saved in His sight? Yes. Do I need to have that confidence? Turn, turn to 1 John. Turn to 1 John. Um, just go to chapter 5. There's a couple verses in chapter 2. But we don't have time. Let's just go to verse 5, chapter 5. We need to know this verse is in the Bible. I wish I knew this verse was in the Bible when I was a kid. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. The word believe there is in the Greek present tense indicating a continuous action going on. Not just a one-time action. These things I write to you who continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may wish, hope, think, want, that you may what? Yes. Know. That you may, K-N-O-W, know that you could have, might have, that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. What kind of confidence do we need to have as Christians? If I am a faithful Christian, that's who this verse is talking to, it's faithful Christians. If I'm a faithful Christian, what do I need to know? That I have eternal life. And if I know that I have eternal life, is that a piece of armor for me? Is that a defense for me? For me to know in my head where I have my helmet, for me to know in my head where I have my helmet, that I am saved in the eyes of God, and that He is going to give me a home in heaven with Him forever and ever and ever, and He's promised that to me right now. And so when the devil comes at me and tries to tempt me to do wrong, what do I need to remember? I've got a home in heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions. Who are they for? They're for us. And when I'm tempted to do wrong, I need to remember the promise that God has for me. The promise of eternal life that He's going to give to me. And that needs to, that hope of eternal life, that hope of salvation needs to be what motivates me not to give in to the devil. So we've said a lot of these, but here's, here's our responsibility. That word take, I've got it up here. That word take is, is almost everywhere else in the New Testament, it is translated receive or accept. That's interesting. Take the helmet of salvation. All right, I'll take it. I will take it and I will put it on. Salvation is a gift, isn't it? God will give it to me. God will give me the salvation. God will give me the helmet, and then what do I need to do? Truly put it on. Truly believe. Truly believe that salvation is mine if I faithfully serve Him and not get torn away, pulled away, or move away from that promise and that hope that He's given to me. This, this armor of God, it, it's amazing how much there is to talk about. You think it's only, it's only four verses in Ephesians 6, that even talk about this armor. And yet God says, we need to put every piece of it on. We need to understand what it is. And we need to make sure that it becomes a part of who we are. Thank you all for your good attention tonight. Let me tell you what your checklist is. Put your breastplate on. Take your helmet. If you've got kids in the cradle roll class, please go and get them. They're calling your name right now. If you have kids that are not in the cradle roll class but are older than that, Go to the family room and pick them up. If you have kids that are grown and have moved out of the area, congratulations. Um, go get a cookie. <laughs>